Okay. The floor is to you, Byron. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all for being here today, this afternoon, with us for the Green IT uh, training um, event. Uh, I'm going to, to present you uh, the notion of Green IT, uh, what Green IT is about. But uh, before I start uh, with presentation, um, I would like to take a quick, let's say, survey, take some quick uh, questions uh, and uh, ask you uh, if you know uh, what um, a Green IT uh, is about. Um, I would like to to take your um, your phones or your PC. You can uh, scan this QR code, or you can uh, in a browser window you can write this uh, website uh, ahaslights.com and put this ID, whatever you find more easy. So when you've done that, I would like to ask you to uh, reply to these questions if you know what a green IT is about. Uh, all uh, answers are anonymous, okay? So you can answer it without any fear. Okay, I don't know if you have managed to access uh, this. I'm sorry, I still haven't answered. Uh, the same for uh, me. There are some uh, limitations from, uh, from uh, the, the, yeah. the platform. Sorry. It says that uh, they have reached the yeah. maximum okay. number of participants. That's the, the same My for me. Okay, sorry about that. It's a free version, so I didn't see that uh, it says that uh, has a user's limit. Can I answer in the chat? Uh, yeah, uh, of course, you can answer the chat if you want. Okay. Oh, yes, yes, okay. I'll close it since it's not working. Um, uh, Piera, riprova che vedi che ti riesce. Adesso sono riuscita anch'io. Mm. I have already answered. Uh, anyway, I'll try know. again. Submit it. Just one. No. So, okay, okay. No, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Byron. I'm sorry. Okay, don't, don't worry. Uh, as long as it's not uh, working, we, I continue with uh, the presentation. Uh -huh. So, uh, I think uh, uh, green, green IT uh, is uh, the, uh, the shortest from the green information technology and uh, refers to the design, designing and using computers and generally IT resources efficiently and effectively with minimal, neutral, or even if possible, positive impact on the environment. This concept uh, emerged uh, uh, quite a lot of years ago in 1992 uh, by the United States Environmental Protection uh, Agency uh, when they first uh, uh, launched the Energy Star uh, volunteer labeling, uh, which uh, identified products that had uh, a superior uh, energy uh, efficiency. Uh, what are the goals of uh, Green IT? The Green IT uh, aims to improve the energy efficiency of IT systems. Um, use less hazardous materials on uh, IT devices. Promote the recycling and the IUs of uh, these devices. 
uh, improve, uh, improve overall business sustainability and uh, using renewable energy uh, for ID uh, for IT uh, purposes. As you can see here, there are four dimensions of uh, green IT. The, the first one is a green design of uh, IT uh, systems. How we design systems that are uh, environmental friendly, consume less uh, energy, um, uh, are easier to recycle uh, and things like that. Uh, the second dimension is green manufacturing uh, of uh, IT systems. Uh, this is about um, creating uh, IT devices um, that uh, 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 are easy to, uh, to, to recycle, that are uh, made uh, from recycled parts, uh, and use um, um, uh, during the, the manufacturing process uh, sustainable procedures. Uh, here also we have the green use of IT systems is how we uh, use these uh, IT devices and how we dispose of them is the final dimension. Uh, about the first two uh, dimensions, uh, about the first two dimensions we cannot do too much, uh, but we can do a lot of things for the green use of IT devices and the disposal uh, of um, IT systems. Let's see what are the, the benefits of uh, green uh, IT. The benefit of green, of green IT is that uh, uh, helps to the reduction of carbon uh, emissions. Uh, according to United Nations, carbon emissions must be reduced by 76% uh, every year to 2030. And uh, IT devices uh, play an important role uh, in this. Another benefit is that we create less waste, less IT waste. Through reuse uh, and refurbishing uh, can be reduced the wastes and we can improve supply chain uh, resilience. We also have the cost savings. The use of energy efficient uh, IT devices produce devices that, uh, requ uh, that requires uh, less uh, energy uh, which uh, in turn this has uh, a significant impact on the energy cost we pay uh, for them. On the other hand, uh, raise the awareness. Uh, business through implementation of green IT products contribute, contribute to the raising of their customers' awareness about climate change. Uh, everybody of us uh, hear how important this is and uh, uh, all uh, products that are produced today give uh, a great emphasis to their power consumptions and our green characteristics and how friendly this is to the environment. So uh, this is something that raises uh, awareness, uh, awareness uh, and make uh, uh, us more sensitive to these um, things. Uh, it also improves corporate culture. Green IT adoption from a company indicates to their employees that they work in a company that respects the environment and encourages them to adapt more, more efficient ways uh, of working also. Improve reputation. Companies improve their reputation by demonstrating an ecological profile. And uh, customer satisfaction is increased because customers feel, uh, still feel satisfied because they consume product that respect uh, the environment and uh, improve sustainability. Okay, which, um, let's see now which uh, aspect, which IT aspects uh, affect um, the environment. Uh, I had also prepared a question for this, but okay, let's continue. Uh, the device, uh, the, aspect, the aspects of IT that affect the environment, it's first of all the IT uh, retail devices, uh, our PCs, our laptops, printer, printers, monitors, smartphones, TVs, tablets, all these uh, gadgets and uh, equipments we, we use. Beyond of that, there are also data centers. 
which uh, is a collection uh, of IT devices that supports the operation of various business uh, information systems, uh, cloud computing, uh, etc. Um, this uh, larger, uh, these data centers uh, usually have uh, uh, require extensive energy requ have extensive energy requirements, uh, not only for their uh, operation but for the uh, cooling uh, purposes, as we can, as we can see um, later. There is also the network uh, equipment. Uh, are all the network devices that we use to keep us uh, online. There's the data storages. Through online storage, a huge amount of data, uh, for example, uh, videos, photos, are transferred through network to cloud storage uh, centers. It's the cryptocurrency. Uh, crypto, cryptocurrency mining, it's a very resource intensive uh, process and uh, requires significant computational power and uh, hence uh, has a great power consumption. For example, the Bitcoin. Uh, artificial intelligence is also a, computa a computationally intensive process. And uh, finally, we have the various IT waste, wastes which uh, pollutes uh, our environment and concerns all broken or uh, retired uh, devices uh, we have used some time. What we can do uh, about it? So, concerning the, as I already said, concerning the first two uh, dimensions, the how to design or manufacture uh, IT devices, we cannot really do uh, directly too much uh, uh, things, but uh, however, we can uh, indirectly uh, contribute to, to this direction by developing attitudes that will force companies to create more eco-friendly products and services and uh, also uh, put pressure to governments to uh, establish laws uh, that are more strict uh, about creating and manufacturing uh, eco-friendly uh, IT devices. However, there is a lot of uh, things that we can do uh, for the dimension of how we can use uh, IT devices in an eco-friendly way and how we can treat and manage uh, IT uh, weights. And this is something that can be done from all people and uh, or learn people to do that even from the early uh, ages. Okay, let's start uh, the first with IT device recycling. Uh, the management of IT of uh, IT devices, uh, the waste management of IT devices, which is known as uh, e-waste. Uh, is not something uh, easy. Uh, with the term waste, we um, refer to, uh, to describe electronic products that uh, have become unwanted, not working or obsolete, or have reached the end of their useful lives. Uh, some examples of e-waste include computers uh, or other computer components such as keyboards, uh, mouses, uh, printers, uh, monitors, smartphones, microwaves, TVs, radios, electronics, uh, electronic platform, electronic uh, toys, uh, electronic uh, game, game consoles, uh, and things like that. Uh, the, uh, the IT device, uh, the we waste management, uh, refers to reuse or refurb refurbish refurbishment or recycle of these uh, IT devices. E-waste is harmful. Uh, it's harming our environment. Uh, it's, ha it's harming human health, uh, pollute food chain, and many other things. Uh, here I have a, a video that describes very well uh, why uh, e-waste is, uh, ha is um, harmful. We can see it. Billions of people are using a lot of electronic devices. Therefore, it is natural that a lot of e-waste arises. 
Americans throw away an estimated $55 billion in e-waste material annually. The World Health Organization is warning that the amount of e-waste around the world is growing significantly. But what is e-waste and why are there many health risks associated with it? Electronic waste, referred to as e-waste, includes all discarded electric or electronic devices. The danger produced from e-waste may come from direct contact with harmful materials and heavy metals such as lead, cadmium, and chromium, from inhalation of toxic fumes, and from the leaching of toxic materials and their accumulation in soil, water, and food. According to the Institute of Physics, the huge amount of lead in e-waste, if released into the environment, could cause severe damage to human blood and kidneys, as well as to the central and peripheral nervous systems. Even some current recycling activities can pose a risk of injury. To date, there has been some recycling of the valuable elements contained in e-waste, such as copper and gold. However, these are often extracted using fairly primitive methods, such as burning cables to remove the plastic and extract the copper. These methods expose workers, who are often children, to toxic fumes. According to The Who, several organizations have highlighted the need for interventions in the field of e-waste. A lot of organizations target children as they are the most vulnerable to harm from exposure to e-waste. As children are still growing, harmful substances can affect their development to a greater extent. So what can you do to help combat e-waste? You can sell or donate old electronics. You can maintain electronics properly so they last longer. You can recycle and dispose of e-waste properly. Before buying a new electronic device, consider repurposing an old one. You can store data online to clear storage space and help your electronics last longer. You can buy ENERGY STAR rated electronics. There is good reason to follow these few simple rules. By recycling 1 million cell phones, more than 35,000 pounds of copper, 33 pounds of palladium, 772 pounds of silver, and 75 pounds of gold can be recovered. That material is not only worth money, but recovery will also help to reduce the amount of mining necessary. But why is it so hard to follow these rules? Because nowadays electronics are made to be replaced. It's called planned obsolescence. Take for example how Apple's latest operating system made extensive use of haptic features that required an iPhone 6S and so forth. These kinds of features are very common in today's electronics and so you are forced to replace them and one has to wonder what happens to the old appliances. Can they be fully recycled now that parts of them are no longer needed? This situation is further worsened by the economics of gadgets. Very often it is cheaper to buy something new than to fix something old. And so we find ourselves with two unfortunate situations. The first is the dangerous increase in mining for procurement for the materials needed for production of gadgets. And the second is large amounts of electronics in landfills leaking toxicity. What is sad is that this waste could easily be reduced by reuse, repair, or resale. According to the report of ENS Europe Agency, built-in obsolescence has seen the share of large household appliances that had to be replaced within the first five years grow from 7% in 2004 to 13% in 2013. And companies are also to blame as they increasingly end support for older models or the operating systems that run on them. E-waste is caused by the whole idea of pushing consumers to buy products quickly by making older ones obsolete, and it is causing havoc on our planet. It's a complicated issue that requires a complex solution. One such solution would be to require electronic sellers to provide buybacks or return systems for used equipment. Export limits could also be introduced, where the quantity exported has to equal to that recycled or reused. There are plenty of solutions that can be conceived if we just put our hearts into it. And for the sake of our environment, we should.
Okay. I think that you uh, could see a lot of pictures uh, of how big uh, e-waste problem is. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, how uh, e-waste uh, is uh, problem uh, is promoted through uh, our everyday um, habits to to change uh, quick uh, quickly our um, devices uh, companies um, includes in their devices new characteristics or stop supporting all devices so by that way force us uh, to change them uh, and all this creates a lot of um, e weights um, but okay let's see how big problem really it's uh, e waste uh, and uh, which is the number of uh, e waste that's produced um, uh, annually uh, every year is produced about 50 million uh, tons of uh, e waste this is equivalent to uh, 125,000 of jumbo jets, which is more than the commercial aircraft ever created. Uh, it is the equivalent of almost 4,500 Eiffel Towers. Or I don't know if you know the how large is Manhattan, but uh, uh, they could cover an area that the size uh, of Manhattan. This is the amount of e-waste that is produced every year so we have uh, a lot of e waste uh, that is a big problem and that really needs to be uh, properly uh, managed what is e-waste management how we can manage it e-waste management is a difficult process generally as concerned it devices because they are not made for recycling e-waste contain plastic, contain toxic materials, contain also precious metals, such as, such as gold. Uh, ways to manage uh, e-waste is uh, reuse, is refurbishment, it is recycling. Here we can see how uh, e-waste recycling is made. This is a video who shows how 6 million pounds of electronic waste properly re recycled uh, in a month uh, from uh, a business that is created for this way and is uh, a company uh, that has uh, high standards uh, in uh, uh, e-waste uh, recycling. And keep this in mind because later we can see how recycling is made in other areas of the world. These are old printers, computers, and phones, and this machine's shredding them to be recycled. Only about 17% of all electronic waste ends up like this. It's very hard to recycle electronics. They're not designed to be recycled. There are hundreds of tiny pieces hidden in every device, from toxic materials to plastic to gold. And they each have to be separated and recycled individually. Such precision takes lots of people, space, and heavy-duty machines with a good deal of feminine power. Sally is our big shredder. Heidi is German. Ginger's our metal finder. Female dominant machines. Of course, yes. <laughs> and if everything goes right, there's lots of money to be made. We'll pull off the pieces which will be of value. That's Ingrid, president of Sims Lifecycle Services, one of the largest e-recyclers in the US. Ingrid took us through her biggest facility, to see how it's repurposing or recycling up to six million pounds of old electronics every month. So we're in Laverne, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville. This is a 200,000 square foot facility where we focus on receiving, processing electronics. Sims mainly gets electronic waste from office gear, like laptops, computers, printers, or phones. We have 4,500 companies like HP and Lexmark, insurance companies, banks. The rest of its clients are secret, but Ingrid can tell us what happens to these devices once they get here. Reuse, repurpose, 
re-engineered if we can't reuse it. Very last resort is recycling. What you see here is where we first get the material in. It's a FIFO type of process, first in, first out. That's how we work it. Here she's offloading a truck, so she'll go in, get her forks into the pallet, and pull it out. You know, it's supposed to come from an office refresh. It looks like there's some old DVD players, some old stereo equipment. The first stop, the scale. Then they will get the weight and input it into our data center. And that's what Drew is doing over there with the computer. Then it gets tagged with a barcode. It'll tell us whether we go to destroy recycle or we go to reuse. The building's broken up into recycling on the right and reuse on the left. We'll start here. If we can reuse it and reuse the parts, then you're not making a new part. So this is the part harvesting area for laptops. Sometimes when you can't sell a whole laptop, we can remove parts from it and either rebuild a laptop to sell or sell the parts. To get all these tiny pieces out of a device without hurting them, it takes a lot of skill and... Different screws, a lot of different screws. So much of it still needs to be done manually and to do it properly, and that's very labor-intensive. Memory units, processors, screens, keyboards, and motherboards can all be reused. Workers will clean them, check that they're functioning, and send them back into inventory to be sold again. Lots of times when we're allowed to sell units, we'll do revenue share with it. So we'll share revenue with the client. So that's kind of a, a nice way to add life to the electronics and then also get some revenue back. Big hard drives pulled from computers or servers are another moneymaker, but they come with an added challenge of security. You can see the fence up. You need a key card to get in. I don't know if I have access. Oh, I do. <laughs> so here is where you'll see the higher value material. Any stored data has to be wiped before a drive can be resold. We have a lot of banks and insurance companies as our clients, so you can well imagine that those folks want their data erased properly. This is where you'll see some of the wiping going on of the hard drives. At the end here, these have already been done, so they're ready to go to the next step to get resold. So our drives will sell wholesale or on eBay. You can see these guys are deemed for eBay. So you'll see one terabyte, 500 gigabytes, all different size drive. These smaller drives, there just isn't any value in it anymore. So if something's simply not worth Sims' time to refurbish, it's sent to be recycled. On the other side is destroy recycle. And over here, we have a lot of folks that are depackaging and also removing hazards. This part's called demanufacturing. So we'll remove hazards, batteries, and all that type of thing before it goes to be shredded on this side. There's a lot of hazardous materials in electronics, like mercury, cadmium, and lead. And if devices end up in landfills, that bad stuff could do major damage to groundwater and soil. This is what we want to ensure does not go into the shredder because this could be really dangerous for fire. If we leave toner in there, I mean, it, it goes up like nothing. Toner is explosive. And then the plastic acts as a fuel source. That's our biggest challenge. <laughs> okay. Everything that's not hazardous gets shredded. So this is Lori, and Lori is running the shredder all with a mouse, right, Lori? This is the control room. I have control of how much goes in the shredder, how much is on the belts. I can stop the belt, I can speed it up, I can jog it. It's a 400 horsepower quad shredder, which means you have these teeth that are grinding up all the material here, and those are nice printers that are getting eaten up and ground out to this on the outside. So this is a really, really cool part. It's very noisy. The first thing that we're trying to do is remove any steel. A giant magnet overhead pulls out all the steel. This is where the charge is added to the material and based on the plus and minus will repel. So the aluminum gets thrown the farthest away, so that's why aluminum is here. And the circuit board is in the middle and the plastic falls right down because it doesn't accept the charge. The leftover mix heads to another machine named Heidi. Heidi is German. Originally, we were using it to separate plastic, but the technology wasn't keeping up. It doesn't work on black plastic. And you see today, everything's black plastic. 
Now, Heidi separates everything using infrared technology. Ginger's our metal finder. She was named after the engineer who designed her because he had a ginger beard. And ginger is just taking out any further metal that's still within the plastic mix. What's left goes into the Dutch sink float machine named Otto. So I guess that's the only male machine we have. In Otto, plastic floats while everything else sinks. We scoop off the top the good stuff, and that's what will go to Montreal to our plastic compounder, and then goes back to HP to get reused into parts. And those raw materials can make Sims some pretty good money. So we really want to recover that value. Every electronic has precious metals in it. Some gold, some copper, some platinum, some palladium. So all these elements can be separated and sold to be reused piecemeal. The copper and precious metal streams will go to a copper smelter in Canada or in Europe or Japan. The steel will go to a steel mill here in Tennessee. But with more than 75% of e-waste landfill bound, companies are missing out on huge profits. To put it in perspective, in 2019, an estimated $57 billion worth of precious metals and valuables and electronics were thrown away or burned. If we recycle it, then we're not digging holes and mining for virgin metals. It's a way to get some really precious commodities without expending all that energy and damage to the environment. But it's a catch-22. Recycling e-waste could be a moneymaker, and it's better for the environment. But it's both really hard and expensive to do. They're not designed to be recycled. Many different chemical compounds all smashed together. When devices got smaller and smaller, removing whole components became less and less possible. Treating and disposing of these hazardous materials is dangerous and pricey. Recyclers also have to constantly upgrade machines and processes to keep up with this changing technology. And that's costly too. We normally change the blades once a year. And when it gets towards the end, the blades get a bit dull. Well, that's when we get a little bit anxious. And sometimes they're jams. Sims has invested a thousand hours updating just its Sally the Shredder machine. And while recyclers are facing all of these challenges, e-waste is only expected to increase by 38% over the next decade. So is there a way to make e-recycling easier? Some say it starts with manufacturers. What a lot of the manufacturers are focused on, rather than making products live a long time, they see their way out is to keep selling as many products as they can as rapidly as possible. And they try to compensate by saying, don't worry, it's recyclable. And so this churn and burn mentality is very harmful. Jim thinks one solution could be for manufacturers to create electronics that are actually meant to be recycled. For example, making devices that don't have toxins, so they're safer and easier to break down. But until that happens, Sims will keep wiping and shredding those hard to recycle electronics. Okay. I think it was very uh, interesting. You really see uh, what's meant that uh, when we say that uh, uh, IT devices are not made for uh, recycling. Uh, you can see that uh, these devices are smashed, shredded, uh, and then they try to uh, give uh, to distinguish the various uh, parts uh, of it, which are the metal, which are the aluminium, which are the plastic. It's not easy process. There are three or four uh, machines that have to be passed in order to to, to be able to separate uh, all uh, these things. And uh, in fact, things are not uh, getting any better in terms that devices are made uh, more and more smaller. We want smaller devices. We want devices that make more, uh, with devices that is uh, more light uh, in our hands, has less weight. So uh, this requires a higher degree of um, integration, which makes uh, more difficult uh, the, the recycling and the separation of uh, different um, parts. Uh, also, the design of the devices is not recycling friendly. For example, uh, uh, let's see our modern uh, cell phones, mobile phones. Uh, you cannot remove the battery. And uh, in older phones, uh, you can uh, remove the battery and recycling uh, was easy. 
And now, if you, if you want to, to smash uh, or shred a, a mobile phone, you have to remove the battery first because uh, it, will it will take uh, fire in this, in, inside the machine. So uh, it's very difficult to you must you have to to warm the phone up to seventy or eighty degrees to be able to take apart the cover and uh, get access to to the battery. Uh, so what we said before, the design and manufacturing, uh, the green IT design and green IT manufacturing, manufacturing is uh, something um, uh, important uh, for the new. Uh, IT devices in order to be uh, eco-friendly. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, we can. Yes, thank you. Okay, but let's see. Okay, maybe many of us try to recycle IT devices. And uh, we believe that we do uh, our duty. But, okay, in fact, how much IT device, how much waste are being recycled? Uh, it has been calculated that the global e waste generation is 53.6 megatons per year. Uh, this was concerned the year 2019. Uh, so, probably, this has been uh, increased. The undocumented e-waste management worldwide is 44.3 megatons, and only the 70.4% of e-waste are uh, are properly recycled, and the recycling the recycling is uh, documented. Uh, so uh, we have a huge amount of e-waste that uh, travel around uh, the world uh, and thrown the landfills instead of properly managed and uh, recycled. This map here shows the problem of e-waste. With green are countries that uh, send e-waste and with red are regions that receive e-waste. They also produced e-waste, but in very small uh, amounts. For example, and uh, at the lower side of this picture, you can see that, for example, United Kingdom produced 24.9% uh, of uh, e-waste, Denmark 24.8%, while uh, Ethiopia only 0.5%, uh, Afghanistan 0.6%, Nepal 0.8%. So there's a huge a difference of e-waste produced by different parts of countries. Unfortunately, uh, uh, countries that produce the lesser amount of uh, e-waste uh, accept, received the huge amount of e-waste from uh, other uh, developed uh, countries, such as America, Canada, Europe, Australia, uh, and so on. Okay, so. As already we said that the most uh, amount of the most e-waste uh, goes to these countries, uh, such as India, China, or uh, Africa. Uh, how all these e-waste are treated there? Uh, here then I have uh, a video from uh, India, which shows how uh, this guy's um, a startup uh, company uh, in India that processed the 70% of India's formal e-waste and is a good example of, of how India um, process uh, e-waste. It is a good example uh, of India. Uh, I would like to see it having in mind the previous video we saw, we saw uh, that was a factory uh, in somewhere in the uh, United States that uh, shows how IT devices uh, were recycled uh, there. The 
problem of e-waste is very recent and tricky to nail down. Unlike probably 10 years back when the producers uh, made products which lasted a little longer, uh, currently the products are made for, you know, dump. Uh, right now, if you see the word which is coined for this is designed for dump. So most companies will make products which are designed for dump so that you can dump it easily and buy new products. So that means there will be more and more electronic waste in the country. And, um, you know, the infrastructure right now is not enough. India is the largest generator of e-waste in the world. And for many years, the waste has been processed by an ill-equipped army of informal workers, often prone to serious health hazards. But this is very slowly changing. Namo e-waste, founded by Akshay Jain in 2014, is solving the problem bottom-up. The problem with unorganized sector is that they're not aware about the hazards on themselves as well as others. So they do what they do to make money. And these people are the, are the people who are deeply grounded into the collection mechanism. They can do, go from door to door and collect it. Whereas it is just impossible for a company or an organized sector to go that down into the collection mechanism. Whereas uh, in our model now, we are trying to incorporate them, make them our collection agents. It's always better that they do their job, which they are best at because they can control the cost there. While uh, us as a company going directly to the public, it, there will be of course more cost that would be involved. So with these people, I see them as an asset in, in the value chain. Santosh Yadav, who migrated to Delhi from the neighboring state of Uttar Pradesh, is one such worker. He was an informal recycler earlier, but today has the skills and knowledge to understand the impact of his work. If these things are out there, they will be afraid of the people. Because in PVC, they are the same. If you have a cold or a cold or a cold, you can make a TB disease. So if we are keeping it, we will be able to make it a difference in the world. हम अपना रोजगार भी पा रहे हैं और मालिक का दो पैसे का फायदा भी हो रहा है और काम भी धंधा मजदूर भी आगे बढ़ते जा रहे हैं क्योंकि वेस्ट इधर उधर फेंकने से तो कोई फायदा है नहीं जिससे दो पैसा मिल सकता है और बातावरण सही हो जाए लोगों को परेशानी ना रहे अगर हर देश में ऐसे किया जाए तो बड़ी अच्छी बात है With the help of informal workers who have been brought into the fold, the startup is present in 26 states across the country and processes 70% of all the e-waste generated. Once picked up and brought to the factory, the waste is segregated into repairable and non-repairable assets. The ones that can be repaired are put back into the market at a quarter of its cost and the non-repairable ones are picked apart and recycled further. Even in formal recycling units, the threat of exposure to toxic chemicals is no less. Obsolete products often contain the most harmful of these. CRT TVs, uh, not the current ones, LCDs, LEDs, but the old CRT monitors, I think, which we have a lot of quantity here, so these are the ones which contain mercury. And mercury is a highly, highly toxic substance for a human body. Even a slightest exposure of mercury uh, exposes you to the risk of cancer. TFC gases uh, comes out of uh, these uh, large appliances like air conditioners and refrigerators. We extract those gases and store it properly and then dump it carefully. The law around e-waste in India, based on a framework used around the world, shifts the burden of waste management to manufacturers. 
The rationale behind this was that manufacturers would spend less on designing eco-friendly products rather than setting up large waste management units. While theoretically robust, the ground level implementation of this is very poor. The e-waste rules came in in 2012 for the first time and then it was revised in 2016. So it's a pretty recent rule, I mean it's just a couple of years. And unfortunately, though the e-waste infrastructure started coming up way back in 2009, um, you know, countries not really prepared. Because if you look at even the producers who are supposed to be responsible for managing e-waste or collecting e-waste, there's hardly any system that they've set up. Ensuring strict implementation of the e-waste law might take time, given the burgeoning nature of the problem. In the meantime, it's upon recyclers like Akshay Jain to monitor the floodgates. I was called a kabadi wala and still, if I talk to people, they, they look at me as a kabadi wala only. But uh, again, if you organize something, there is a potential in everything. That is how I see it. Okay. This was, let's say, a model recycling company in India. And um, you can see the huge difference that uh, exists uh, in this part of the world uh, in comparison to recycling companies and factories in the United States or other places of uh, developed countries. And what has, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if you noticed that the, the Indian government uh, have um, placed a law uh, to improve uh, e-waste management that force companies to recycle their products. Uh, the rationale under this was that it was more difficult. It is in order to to that they uh, that is because it's difficult to manage uh, e-waste, they will be forced to design more. Uh, eco-friendly uh, products. So instead of placing laws uh, that make them force the companies to design uh, uh, eco-friendly uh, devices, they force them to manage them so indirectly uh, to, to push them to, to make the, uh, the design of e waste uh, devices in order not to spend too much money uh, for that. But um, uh, you see, uh, the result, uh, I don't think I have to say uh, too much uh, about this. And the question is, if this is how uh, a model company handles e-wastes uh, in uh, this place of the world that the 45, almost 45% of e-wastes uh, end up, uh, what about the rest? What's happening, what's happening about uh, the rest? Uh, this, the next video, uh, shows <laughs> how uh, the informal way uh, of e-waste management and uh, in fact describes how uh, it is recovered the gold uh, from uh, electronic uh, scrap uh, in these uh, places. You can also notice how many more actions in this video uh, pollute the environment and contribute to carbon dioxide emissions and many other things.
This is the melting things, like that thing. Yeah. तेरी तो जलेगी मैं हीरो बन रहा हूँ ना। बेहुसंकेत। राउडी रखो। दिखाने में संभाले तो कौन? आते हैं समझ के आए।
dangerous this process was, all the dangerous, the hazardous uh, chemicals they used, the, how this waste, how this, uh, where this thrown away, the water pollution, uh, the air pollution, the damage to, to their health, the people around them, uh, how important it is for these people to be get informed about this, properly trained, uh, and uh, uh, many more. Okay, what lessons learn from all this? We uh, what from uh, e-waste management? What can we do to improve uh, e-waste management? Okay, let's see. We can change our lifestyle or try to buy and try to buy uh, new devices less frequently uh, or only when we really need to do this. Uh, try to fix old devices uh, instead of replacing them. Uh, always use proper recycling uh, of all devices using, using trustworthy companies because if you make a research uh, on the web, you can see that uh, a lot of um, videos uh, and uh, that uh, the organization that examine investigate uh, the area of uh, IT device recycling uh, so that many companies uh, that there are some companies that they say that recycle uh, IT waste uh, but uh, what they do is uh, just to take some money for creating um, a recycling profile and forward all this is uh, this IT e waste to to the third world. Uh, we should also try try to, to push companies to make push pre, to put press to companies to produce greener and easier to recycle products. I don't know if you have heard it, but uh, European Union asks uh, from the companies to from the mobile phones to have the batteries uh, easy uh, changed uh, from people, not be uh, in one uh, package, a unibody, in a unibody form as uh, the form of uh, our modern cell phone uh, is. Uh, and uh, also we can press governments to, to create appropriate legislation uh, and audit companies for their practices. Also press international organizations, governments, to help poor countries to create mechanisms for proper, for proper formal e-waste recycling, inform their citizens for the dangers of free waste, and um, things like that. I don't know if you want to, to add something here that we can do. Okay. Let's move on to the next, which is the green IT use, how we use IT uh, devices. I suppose that uh, all of us have IT devices in our house and uh, most of us uh, put them, know, know what standby mode is of uh, these devices. Uh, 
Before proceeding that, I want to say that green device IT use refers to reducing power consumption of IT devices, applying new habits in the way we use IT devices, and reducing large data center power consumption. Uh, now, let's go back to, to the standby mode. Standby power consumption is also called phantom or vampire power and um, refers to the energy that is consumed by various electric devices when they seem to be turned off. Uh, these devices are only switched off through their electronic interface and uh, are not really uh, switched off uh, from the plug. So they consume energy because they need to display some uh, lights or have the sensors uh, in operation. Uh, beyond the, the standby power consumption, which uh, is uh, more or less known, uh, is the consumption that is called off-power uh, power consumption, which refers to the power cons consumed by electronic devices when they are switched off by their connecting to power outlets. Such devices are multimedia devices, game consoles, smart kitchen appliances, and other smart devices, char char chargers, TVs. Uh, some investigators uh, argue that such devices consume the 70% of the electricity uh, during their life cycle uh, when they run on standby or off mode. Uh, and in the phantom power can uh, add up up to 10% of the home's energy cost. Is the cost we pay for devices that we think that is closed and not consume energy. Here is some habits that enhance uh, phantom power consumption is the use uh, of standby. You can also find it in uh, some devices as sleep mode, such as laptops or computers, or rest mode. Uh, and some have habits to, to put these devices on standby mode when we finished uh, our job uh, with them instead of shutting them down. The same is also applied to TVs or uh, other uh, multimedia devices. Um, but uh, here I must note that there are some modern devices that do not have a switch off uh, button. So uh, you can only put them on standby um, mode. The last years uh, to these devices, to these IT devices, were added. Uh, network devices such as modems, routers, switches, Wi-Fi repeaters, or other uh, network devices that we have uh, in our homes in order to be online and to have connection to, vi to virus device, have connection to internet on uh, other devices, uh, and these devices are always uh, on. Okay, let's see what. Uh, governmental authorities and industry uh, have done for this or do for this. All devices had a significant power consumption. However, since 2009, uh, such devices are required to switch into lower power mode, such as standby, standby after a reasonable amount uh, of uh, time. For example, if you have some uh, TV monitor, some old TV monitor, you will see that when you close the desktop, after some time, a minute, two minutes, five minutes, it depends on how old is your device, uh, they switch to standby uh, mode. Uh, in 2010, the European Commission, under the recommendation of International Energy uh, Agency, banned devices with standby consumption more than one watt. Let's see some examples of such devices. For example, a washing machine uh, had uh, a 7 watt cons electric consumption when it was on but not running, and had a 4 watt consumption when it was off. Uh, the first uh, generation of an Apple TV uh, had a 20 watt consumption when it was on and 17 when it was off. Uh, also, the same, almost the same for a Samsung. A cable box and a Apple MacBook who, when it was 48 watts when it was open it charged, also 48 watts when it was closed at not uh, charging and 27 watts 
uh, when it was open and uh, fully charged. This is a, a good practice uh, to have always laptops plugged in uh, because by that way they consume less uh, energy. Uh, otherwise, the energy they consume is almost doubled uh, because they had to charge uh, the battery. So we, use, we should use the battery only when we really uh, need it. Uh, other examples are, for example, a router that consumes uh, 4 watts when it goes on, uh, a cable modem, uh, and a video TV, or uh, some uh, speakers uh, that you can see the difference between the energy they consume when they are on and when they are off. Uh, you can see that the most modern devices have uh, much more or less energy power consumption when they are on standby mode uh, or uh, uh, not uh, running. Uh, since uh, 2019, uh, 2013, uh, the limit uh, was further reduced, so such devices must not consume more than uh, 0.5 watts instead of 1 watt. Uh, this was further reduced to 0.5 watts in standby or uh, in off mode. Um, these uh, rules uh, have uh, reduced annual electricity consumption by around 35.5 terawatt-hours terawatt uh, per year, the, equi the equivalent of the annual uh, energy consumption of uh, Romania. And this has saved uh, consumers 25 billion uh, euros per year and uh, 39 megatons of CO2 uh, emissions. From, since uh, January 2017, network standby devices uh, must not consume uh, more than 3 to 12 watts, depending uh, on the product. And this, if it is compared to that these devices used to consume 20 to 80 watts, it's a significant uh, improvement. It's, it is expected that um, uh, will contribute to an extra saving of 36 to 38 terawatt hours uh, per year. Okay, <clears throat> we saw here that devices consume 0 0.5, 0 0.3 uh, watts uh, per hour, and okay, this is not too much uh, consumption. But um, uh, Alan Meyer from the Department of Energy of uh, Berkeley Lab estimate that the American household has roughly 50 devices that draw power even they seem to be off. Uh, if we multiply all these small consumptions by the time they're plugged in and by each and every one of the thousands of millions of devices in homes or in commercial buildings uh, that are in the whole world, this results an important share of the electricity uh, use. Uh, the estimates that uh, uh, the cost of this consumption is more than, uh, than 19 billion dollars in electricity bills every year in all over the world. So <clears throat> individually is not too much, but if we uh, end up uh, all this uh, together, uh, then we have a significant energy uh, consumption. And the question is, is that only, is this phantom power the only hidden power that can consume in our, in our everyday use of uh, IT devices? Well, unfortunately, this is not. Uh, during the last two decades, we have developed habits such as music, video streaming, use of smartphone apps and uh, others that consume a lot of energy that we usually do not consider or we do not even think uh, that we consume uh, energy beyond the energy that is spent from the battery uh, of our phones, for example. Cloud computing and uh, Internet of Things uh, offer us new services, new ways to work and enjoy ourselves, which, however, has a significant, have a significant power consumption. Have we ever considered uh, what is cloud and where is cloud? When we store things to cloud, where do these things go? It's something like 
Ether, Ethereum, uh, where photos from our phones is being stored? Uh, where is Facebook, Instagram, Google services and all of these servicing uh, are running? How much energy consumes a social media post? How, many, how much energy consume a single search in Google? How much energy consume sending an email? How much energy consume a video streaming from a smartphone? Let's see some examples. Uh, according to, to Green Spector, uh, posting a photo uh, consumes uh, almost 0.2 grams uh, equivalent of CO2 equivalence. This is um, the equivalence of CO2 emissions uh, that is needed to uh, produce the energy required to do the specific uh, job. So uh, instead of uh, counting uh, watts or things, we uh, measure the equivalent of CO2 emissions to produce that uh, energy. Publishing a photo story, it's almost 0 0.3 grams of CO2 emissions. Uh, live hosting is uh, almost 0 0.8. Timeline scrolling uh, is almost um, 1.5 grams of CO2 uh, emissions. Uh, according to a 2020 report on social uh, the, about the social media apps environmental uh, impact, scrolling through Instagram news feed was the most impactful function of Instagram generating, generating approximately 1.55 grams of CO2 equivalent per minute. Uh, viewing and hosting a live uh, Instagram uh, followed uh, produces uh, CO2 emissions of uh, approximately 0 0.7 or uh, 0 0.6 uh, grams per minute. Now, if we consider that 65.5% of the world population or 4.6 billion people have access, have access to internet, and uh, according to Google in 2009, a Google search uh, emits uh, 0 0.2 grams of carbon dioxide uh, and takes another uh, 1.76 grams of carbon dioxide, uh, carbon CO2 emissions, an average to load the website, uh, which in some cases, this can be 10 times uh, more, uh, in, depending on the website complexity, if, for example, has videos, then we come across with significant uh, problem. Uh, some other examples is how much, uh, uh, how we pollute uh, by sending emails. Uh, for example, sending a regular email takes about four grams of CO2 uh, emissions. And uh, sending an email with an attachment or a photo, this consumes 50 grams of uh, CO2 uh, emissions. Uh, Instagram also uh, is one of the worst worst habits uh, concerning the energy consumptions and uh, CO2 uh, emissions. Uh, while we posting a photo emits zero uh, zero point seventy seventeen seventeen oh, fifteen uh, grams of uh, CO2. Uh, scrolling uh, a news feed for a minute. Uh, emits 1.5 grams of uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, and this, all this ends up uh, with uh, emissions of uh, 15 grams, 15 kilograms of CO2 emissions per year per person only uh, using uh, Instagram scrolling, Instagram posting. Uh, some uh, picture. And this brings us in front to the notion of digital pollution. What really is digital pollution? Digital pollution is the pollution produced by the use of internets. 
And when we use, when we refer to internet, uh, this is uh, consists from uh, the user devices, from the data centers, and the networks. And all this require energy to operate. Okay, let's see how much is this energy. This is also called the hidden pollution uh, of internet. Uh, I don't know if you ever considered, but I was also surprised uh, when I heard it, that the carbon emissions from internet represents the 3.7% of global uh, carbon dioxide emissions, while the entire aviation industry represents only 3% of these emissions. So internet produce more carbon than all the airplanes flying uh, in a year. This is going to be doubled, doubled by 2025 uh, according to, to estimates. Uh, we can see, uh, here we will see a, a video about uh, the hidden pollution uh, of uh, internet that uh, presents all this. <laughs> How do you pollute? By using your car, throwing a plastic bag in the ocean? Pollution isn't always visible to the naked eye. It also seeps out of our keyboards. Si Internet était un pays, ça serait le 5 ou 6 e plus gros consommateur d'électricité mondiale après les États-Unis, la Chine et la Russie. Usually, when people think of the Internet, they think of a virtual world floating around us. In fact, it's right under our feet. Cables are buried beneath us. They connect the world. Most are on the ocean floor, with routes going everywhere. Thousands of kilometers of them that have to be installed and maintained. These cables are the Internet's hardware, and their reach is growing. By the summer of 2018, a 13,000 kilometer underwater cable would connect Los Angeles to Hong Kong. So what exactly are they for? Well, they're responsible for carrying information to the ogres of the digital age, data centers, centers that run nonstop and need a steady stream of energy, monsters that overheat and need air conditioning to keep them cool. The facility is approximately the size of 10 football fields and houses tens of thousands of high performance processing and storage servers in high density racks that are separated by hot and cool air aisles on a traditional raised floor. The biggest concentration of data centers in the world is in the U.S. state of Virginia. Old Dominion, as it's affectionately called, gets a third of its electricity from nuclear plants, another third from coal, and one itty bitty percent from renewable energies, mostly solar. That right there is digital pollution. Do the math and you'll find a Google search is equivalent to five to seven grams of carbon dioxide. An email weighs 20 grams of CO2. That person who CC'd another six grams. That's the same as using a light bulb for an hour. If every day for a year you send out around 30 emails, you'd produce as much CO2 as a 1,000 kilometer car ride. Add to that all the videos, shows, and movies that get downloaded and streamed. And don't forget those emails you never got around to deleting or the photos that are taking up space in your personal digital safe in what's called the cloud it all adds up internet puts out as much co2 as global air traffic that's two percent of the world's greenhouse gases so what's the answer pull the plug that would be radical instead the idea is to turn the network green by supplying renewable energy to the hungry data centers has set up solar farms on location at its data centers in North Carolina, in the Nevada desert, and in California. They produce so much energy, in fact, that Apple got permission to sell it on wholesale markets. Using and producing renewable energy is one thing. Needing less electricity overall is another. To cool down its data centers, Google set up shop in Finland. Facebook has a data center 100 kilometers away from the North Pole. Microsoft is also finding ways to reduce energy consumption, including by going underwater. Send the divers in. 
27 kilowatts. No greenwashing here. Greenpeace carried out an investigation, and this is what it found. Apple now runs on 83% renewable energy. Only 5% comes from coal. It gets an A. Google and Facebook also get the top grade. Microsoft is just behind. It gets a B. That's a lot better than a few short years ago, and it's in large part because users made their demands heard. A good number of internet giants, however, are still lagging behind. Twitter gets an F, 43% of its energy comes from coal. Amazon and Netflix are also poorly rated. But overall, the trend is bending towards renewables, and large internet companies are putting pressure on governments to get them to offer renewable energy. In the end, the internet might be the one to lead the renewable energy revolution. So will the digital age be a green one? Internet, as regarding the infrastructure, is built around a kind of triangle. You have on one side the data center, you have the devices for the users, and the network in behind. The way uh, the services are developed on this triangle, all the software that are developed for Internet use those resources. The idea is to, to reduce the use of those resources uh, by developing appropriate software and going a bit more back to basic. In the end, we, lose, we use less resources from the data center, from the network, and from the smartphone. We observe a phenomenon that is a constant growing capacity of the smartphone and a growing resource needs from the software. And it's a constant ex escalation. By developing uh, in a responsible and sustainable way, uh, the application uses less from the, the resource from the smartphone, and then the internet user can keep the smartphone longer. <laughs> The way we use the internet can have positive consequences too. Start by weeding out your inbox, deleting emails you no longer need, and typing a website's name directly into the browser. Searching for a site and then clicking on it emits four times as many greenhouse gases. Okay. Sorry. There are 25 million unique data points. There are 2,400. Uh, there's another uh, very interesting video, which is, um, however, too large, is 46 minutes. It is an excellent video. I think that uh, everybody of you must see it. Uh, it describes, um, uh, starts from how we use uh, IT devices uh, in our everyday life, uh, our habits, and um, the uh, pollution, uh, that digital pollution these habits produce. Uh, they also then move forward to data center, uh, what they, they are, uh, how they can be more efficient, effective, uh, what, uh, from where the energy comes to these devices. So it's a small movie, but uh, it's really, really nice. Uh, and I recommend uh, everyone to, to find uh, time and to see it uh, sometime um, later. Uh, another and the last thing I want to, to say about the digital pollution, it's uh, the digital gold. It's the digital mining that we do, uh, and it refers to the use of cryptocurrencies. Uh, that is a wide popular uh, process around the, the world. Uh, and uh, how people, for example, is the example of Bitcoin, uh, and how uh, Bitcoin uh, contributes to the digital pollutions all over uh, the world. There are data centers like those you saw previously uh, that are dedicated to Bitcoin uh, mining. And uh, all these data centers require uh, 129 terawatts uh, of energy, while entire Google uh, ecosystem consumes 12.4 terawatt, terab terawatts of energy. So they consume 10 times more than the whole uh, Google. 
Um, the, the, there's a video, here a short video, and this is the last video we will see, that explain uh, this process uh, and how this is done. Hordes of crypto fanatics got their knickers in a twist recently when erstwhile cheerleader Elon Musk expressed concerns about the environmental cost of Bitcoin. Cryptocurrency is a good idea on many levels, read a statement shared on his Twitter feed. We believe it has a promising future, but this cannot come at great cost to the environment. So how bad is Bitcoin for the planet? And does Musk's radical U-turn mark the beginning of the end for the crypto revolution? Join us on a trip down the mines for an unflinching look at the energy consumption of Bitcoin. You'd be forgiven for thinking, hang on, Bitcoin is that weird fake internet money, right? How on earth does it even have a carbon footprint? Traditional tender such as banknotes printed on hacked down forests or shiny coins minted on rough extracted gold should, intuitively at least, be worse for the environment, right? To understand how it's a bit more complicated than that, let's look at the fundamental conundrum Bitcoin sets out to solve. All digital currencies at some stage or another during their development run up against the so-called double spending problem. If I want to buy, say, a car using shady internet money, it's impossible for the car salesman to know for sure I'm not simultaneously using the very same shady internet money to buy a boat. If I can somehow convince both boat and car salespeople that both transactions are legit, I'll get both a car and a boat and be a hundred miles away before anybody realizes they've been had. With conventional credit cards, all transactions are logged and verified centrally. Which means you can't spend the same money twice or Visa will do you in. Bitcoin is different though. It strives above all else to be decentralized. Bitcoin creator Satoshi Nakamoto's greatest stroke of genius was developing the blockchain. Instead of some all-powerful central bank giving the nod, network computers around the world raced to verify the legitimacy of all recent Bitcoin transactions by solving or hashing elaborate maths puzzles. When one lucky computer somewhere on Earth pulls that off, a verified record of recent Bitcoin transactions is minted, a block that gets coupled to all previous blocks, a blockchain, which then gets copied and shared around the world as a reliable, decentralized ledger of all Bitcoin movements. No one individual can tamper directly with the blockchain, which is the basis of all its value. Back to our example. Whichever transaction, car or boat, is first verified in the hashing feeding frenzy wins, while the other is automatically rejected. And whichever computer out there on the network happens to have won the race to verify that block of transactions is rewarded, at the time of writing, with 6.25 bitcoins. This is worth around $283,000 to that computer's lucky owner, and no double spending in sight. That subtle, complex confirmation mechanism, known as proof of work, is certainly effective at keeping the blockchain in check. Trouble is, it consumes a vast amount of computing horsepower. To maximize your chances of solving the hash and collecting those 6.25 bitcoins, it makes sense for you, the miner, to have computers by the hundred greedily hashing day and night in gigantic, scary server farms. The more computers running, statistically, the more likely they are to succeed. And even though the energy bills are sky high, they're more than offset by the rising value of Bitcoin. Bigger farms run on many thousands of computers, well, graphics cards technically. All but one of those hardworking graphics cards will fail in the attempt, but, and this is key, every single one is still burning up energy in the attempt. I didn't know <laughs> My job is to make college easier because okay. students have problem. How much energy? As interest in Bitcoin soars, Bitcoin mining now consumes some 129 terawatt hours of electricity a year. Compare that to Google's net consumption of a measly 12.4 terawatt hours and the scale becomes obvious. In terms of emissions, driven by a latter-day gold rush of enterprising nerds gunning great battalions of graphics cards 24-7, Bitcoin's carbon footprint alone is now said to rival that of Argentina. Over the past two years, carbon emissions from all that fake mining has grown by some 40 million tons, or the equivalent of 8.9 million cars. Bitcoin is a bigger emitter than American Airlines and is fast catching up with the carbon footprint of the entire federal US government. If you want a British analogy, it's said the energy expended mining Bitcoin in a year could power every kettle in the UK for 27 years. Almost no other human activity is so flagrantly wasteful. 
But so long as proof of work remains the standard, it's just good business sense for Bitcoin farmers to leave their vast banks of graphics cards on constantly as it generates a constant stream of revenue. Energy consumption itself isn't a big deal, by the way. But much of the energy that runs those giant Chinese Bitcoin mines comes directly from dirty coal. As Greenpeace puts it, Bitcoin miners are powering 21st century technology with 19th century energy sources. In Iceland, locals are concerned that rivers are being dammed and natural beauty destroyed purely in order to run the country's thirsty Bitcoin mines. Back to Elon Musk's intervention. Tesla has suspended vehicle purchases using Bitcoin, read his statement. We are concerned about rapidly increasing use of fossil fuels for Bitcoin mining and transactions, especially coal, which has the worst emissions of any fuel. When Tesla announced it planned to accept Bitcoin back in March, the decision was swiftly criticized by industry analyst David Gerrard, who observed Tesla got $1.5 billion in environmental subsidies in 2020, funded by the taxpayer. It turned around and spent $1.5 billion on Bitcoin, which is mostly my chain. Crypto miners' insatiable appetite for the cards often leaves real gamers unable to buy them for their intended purpose. The good news is not all cryptocurrencies are alike. Take Cardano, a rival to Bitcoin, which runs a proof-of-stake consensus as opposed to proof-of-work. This basically means miners tie up some of their own coin as collateral whilst validating transactions, with rewards trickling their way in exchange for participation. Crucially, millions of processors aren't competing in the same space, which means radically lower energy consumption, as little as 6 gigawatt hours across all Cardano mining. Cardano's coin, named Ada after British female computing pioneer Ada Lovelace, works on these principles, as does an ambitious new coinage from the people who created Ethereum, called Ethereum 2.0. Chia, yet another cryptocurrency, uses a novel proof-of-space validation system. Users offer the network empty space on their hard drives, which is a far less energy-intensive process than proof-of-work. Although, in fairness, Chia has caused physical shortages of hard drives in Vietnam and parts of China. Bitcoin is by no means the only environmentally disastrous cryptocurrency. Ethereum's carbon footprint is as big as Hong Kong's. Bitcoin defenders are quick to point out the conventional banking system is a far worse culprit, burning through over 260 terawatt hours compared to their crypto coins' comparatively modest 129 terawatt hours. But when you consider that more than half the world's population uses conventional banking and maybe 100 million use Bitcoin, that comparison starts to look a bit daft. So, what's to be done? Hopefully, Bitcoin will see the error of its ways and amend its proof-of-work approach. Or hopefully, renewable energy sources will pick up the slack. Either way, it's worth remembering Bitcoin's carbon footprint is only half of that of unused domestic appliances lazily left on standby across America. One problem at a time, though, eh? What do you think? Is Elon's carbon complaint a wicked ploy to meddle in the markets? Do you have any... Okay. And this is about cryptocurrency, energy consumption. Uh, what we can do? The answer is not easy, but we can try to buy IT devices that consume less energy. Restrict the use uh, of sleep or start by mode of our IT devices. Develop less power consuming behaviors while using IT devices. Uh, think beyond the screen of our smartphone or laptop in terms of resource we consume is a good start. Uh, okay, this was uh, what I have to present about the Green IT. And uh, to, to end uh, up, okay, let's see how much carbon dioxide we produced during uh, our this uh, meeting. Uh, this is uh, an online uh, calculator about uh, uh, video conference carbon uh, emissions, uh, as you can see. Okay, we have a conference, now a webinar, it was a conference call because everyone can see and talk. The number of participants, how many are we? Are we 15 people? 16? We are currently 20. 20, 20. okay. No. 20 people the duration of our meeting let's say okay it's 100 uh, we already minutes. running on one one hour and 53 minutes at this moment okay, so. okay. 
And we also recording. <laughs> and we are also recording. <laughs> recording. Okay, it is a standard uh, video, not high definition. Say, okay. And we are an EU average. We're not a specific country. So let's make a quick calculation. Okay, we produced uh, 33.3 kilograms of carbon dioxide, which is equivalent of driving. 260 kilometers in an average car. I, I don't know the, the algorithm behind this, but I think they have some standards to do uh, these estimates. So it's a good example of the hidden pollution of, um, of internet and uh, of our uh, digital, worlds, uh, digital world. Uh, if you want, later you can uh, you can check about how much CO2 emissions produce uh, your home due to uh, internet usage. There's another calculator here. You, it's easy to, to do it. You have to, uh, to enter the number of screens, TVs or um, PC monitors uh, you have uh, in your house because this uh, spend, uh, spend um, too much energy. Uh, how many time per day you spend watching online videos and how much time you spend what, not watching uh, videos, doing other things, your type of uh, internet connection and calculate emissions is basically for streaming, uh, watching Netflix or um, uh, other things. And uh, finally, uh, you can see how uh, much uh, CO2 uh, your uh, computer uh, produces, you have to only know some basic aspects. For example, uh, you place here uh, the hours that you use your computers per, per day. Uh, if you have a computer that has only CPU or a, GP, a GPU or both, uh, if you have a laptop, the mainstream is have uh, only CPU because the GPU is integrated to CPU, how many cores uh, has this CPU uh, has. If you know the model of uh, uh, CPU, it has various models here. For example, my computer is, my processor is this one. I have also 16 megabytes of memory and it's a personal computer. I'm in Europe, I'm in Greece. Uh, I don't know other factors, so my uh, it's eight hours per day. So my computer cons produces 428, 29 grams of carbon dioxide uh, per day. This is uh, one kilo of, uh, kilowatt hour um, of energy. Uh, it's equivalent to do 2.5 kilometers by car. Uh, and at the end, there's a graph showing uh, in Greece how much carbon dioxide I emit. And you can see if I was in France or in Sweden, this is more or less because it's more or less because these countries uh, produce a, a significant amount of their energy from uh, renewable uh, sources. It's something you can try uh, later uh, if you want. Uh, that is uh, for me. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I think that I hope that uh, you found uh, this uh, uh, interesting and uh, have a better idea about what green IT is, uh, from which uh, sides you can approach this topic uh, to your students. Uh, how increase their uh, their awareness uh, about uh, IT device recycling, especially IT uses. Uh, and again, I insist to see the the video. This forty five minutes video, it's very very um, well made and very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Byron. Um, I'll just stop the recording. Let's stop the steering.